This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. So if you're saved and you're not working together with the Lord, then you receive the grace of God in vain. This doesn't mean that you're not saved. It means you're saved and you're not living right. It doesn't mean you're not reconciled. Because if you believe then the gospel, if you believe the gospel, then you are reconciled to God. But if you're not working working together with him, then you don't have the ministry of reconciliation, even though you yourself are reconciled. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Here Paul is showing that he is a Bible reader because he's quoting an Old Testament verse. There's no telling how many times Paul read the Old Testament. Can you imagine how great of a Bible student the Apostle Paul was? I bet in a question and answer session like Bob Alexander does or like Ruckman used to do, you couldn't give Paul a Bible question that he wouldn't know off the top of his head. And he could give you book, chapter, and a verse on every answer that he had. He was always ready to give an answer to every man. But he quoted this scripture in Isaiah 49, 8, which says, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. So this is a promise to Jesus Christ, and Paul quoted it, but using it as a promise to us. This shows Paul not only taught doctrine, but was also very practical in his preaching. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is one of my favorite verses to teach that you should get saved today. It says, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So you shouldn't put it off another minute. You could die right now. Not only should you get saved today, but you can get saved today. If you know you're a sinner, and you know you're going to die and go to hell, and you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood, was buried, and resurrected, then you can be saved right now. That's all that's required. Know you're a sinner. You know you're going to hell for those sins. You know Jesus Christ died on the cross for those sins, shed his blood, was buried, and resurrected then God's dealing with you and you can be saved. Not only is today the day of salvation in the sense that you can be saved right now, but also in the sense that today is the day of salvation because Jesus Christ made it possible 2,000 years ago on the cross. You are living in the day of salvation. The Old Testament saints didn't live in this day. They had to wait on the Savior to shed his blood, and that's why they had to go to paradise in the heart of the earth. The blood had not been shed yet, but it has now, and you are in the day of salvation. Now, 2 Corinthians 6, 3, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. This doesn't mean that you have to be politically correct and worried about stepping on people's toes all the time, but you don't want to be one of those people who seeks to offend people. The Bible is already offensive. You don't have to add any extra offensive things. It's already going to offend people. It's already pretty rough in the way it's written. 1 Corinthians 8.13 says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So you don't want to do anything that will hurt the ministry. For example, David taking Bathsheba and killing Uriah gave the lost world occasion to blaspheme. In 2 Samuel 12, 14, it says this. It says, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. People are watching you and waiting for you to offend. They want to catch you in your words. For example, I've heard some preachers may let a cuss word slip while they're preaching. 
Maybe it's in righteous indignation or something. But this just gives the enemy extra ammo. They're going to talk bad about you and spread rumors about you without you doing anything wrong. But the thing is, you don't want to give them a good reason to be slandering you and saying these horrible things about you. 2 Corinthians 6, 3, giving none offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. And this is why in 1 Timothy 3, one of the qualifications for a pastor and deacon is to be blameless. You're going to be talked about. You're going to be slandered. Just make sure all the bad talk about you is false accusations. In 1 Peter 3, 16 and 17, it says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Make sure all the things that they're accusing you of that are bad are false accusations and not true. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. So you should approve yourself and the ministry in your actions. Your actions really do speak louder than your words. So how do we approve ourselves? We, we prove ourselves with patience. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, But in all things, approving yourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Toward all men. 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says a bishop must be patient. 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. When dealing with people, you need to be very patient. Don't fly off the handle. Don't be quick to make smart aleck remarks. Don't be quick to give up on them. If you have been saved 10 years and you're helping a new Christian, then you need to realize he's got a lot more to learn because he's not been doing it as long as you have. So in patience, in afflictions, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 says, in much patience, in afflictions. Afflictions is how you prove yourself. This is something you will face in the ministry. Psalms 34, 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. This has been physical torture for some Christians. And for others, it could be a spouse tormenting them verbally and mentally. If you're going to prove yourself, then when these afflictions come, come out on the other side of the affliction, still a Bible believer, still trying to do your best to serve God. That proves you as a good minister. Next, it says, In patience, in much afflictions, in much patience and afflictions, in necessities. So necessities. As someone who dedicated their life to preaching the gospel, Paul had necessities. He needed food, water, clothes. He needed other things. He said to the Philippians, Philippians 4.16, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. But the word of God is even more important than physical needs, and Paul knew that too. Why do you think he knew so much of the Bible? Paul knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. He knew the disciples, so he knew about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And he lived during the same time as the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul wrote the Pauline epistles. If he was here today, he would know more Bible than every preacher in America put together. He knew the necessity of the words of God. And Job 23, 12 says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So Job thought the Bible was more important than his own food. And I'm sure Paul did too. And if you're going to prove yourself as a faithful minister, what do you see as a necessity? The worldly things that's going to keep you going in this world are the spiritual things. So in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses, do you keep going in distresses? <clears throat> Paul certainly did. The faith of others 
helped his distress. 1 Thessalonians 3, 7 says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Paul goes on to say what things he went through that proved him. In 2 Corinthians 6, 5, In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. So in stripes, in imprisonments, uh, Paul went through it all. Galatians 6, 17, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He was beaten with rods. He had stripes put on him. Uh, Paul was in imprisonments. He preached the gospel in there. And the Philippian jailer got saved, as you know, in Acts 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 5, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults. In tumults, like he saw in Acts 21, a big uproar of a multitude of people. In labors, Paul was a hardworking man. For extra money, he worked as a tent maker. According to Acts 18, 3, he traveled everywhere to get people saved and to edify the saints, and he was always in the word. And 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings. Watchings has to do with watching and praying. And then mix it with fasting. Paul said pray without ceasing. Paul said he was in fastings oft. He put in work as an apostle. He says in 2 Corinthians 6.6, 6, By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Paul lived holy, he said, by pureness. He said in Philippians 4.8, To think about whatsoever is pure. If you're going to be in the ministry, then be as pure as you possibly can by knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul says, by long suffering. He was very long suffering. 2 Timothy 2, 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In the ministry, you're dealing with people who don't know the difference between Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant sometimes. You're dealing with people who think Moses baptized Jesus. You're dealing with people that think a necromancer is what Joe Biden does to people. Uh, when he standing behind them, uh, kissing on their neck. When I first got saved, I thought Creflo Dollar was a, a godly man. I thought the Pope was uh, just the greatest saint in the world. But I, I definitely found out otherwise. You're dealing with people that have no sense when it comes to the Bible, so you got to be long-suffering, patient. Second Corinthians 6, 6, by pureness by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by kindness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Paul says, By the Holy Ghost, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're saved, the Holy Ghost is in you, so yield yourself to it. By love unfeigned. Feigned love would be fake love, so love unfeigned is real love. And there's a picture that shows a man drowning and a hand pulling the man out, and that's real love. There is a picture that shows a man drowning and a man giving him a high five. That's fake love. Real love warns you about hell. Fake love pats you on the back, packs your lunch, and gives you a high five on the way to hell fire. It might look good. But it's evil. Fake love is an evil thing because it is deceptive. Just like the wicked Pope. Look at his serpent eyes. And you'll see he's full of the devil. Uh, why would you kiss the corns on that man's feet? 2 Corinthians 6, 7. By the word of the truth. By the word of truth. By the power of God. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. The word of truth is in your lap right now. If you're following along with me. You have something in your hands that is perfect, the King James Bible. Paul says, by the power of God. 
omnipotent means all-powerful. And you have 24-7 access to the God who is powerful enough to make the universe and smart enough to make your DNA. And he made it out of the dust of the ground. Paul says, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So Ephesians 6 for the instruction manual. That's your instruction manual on putting on the whole armor of God. And Paul says, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians 6, 8 says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true. So Paul was honored by people who loved him and dishonored by those who hated him. <clears throat> Any person who does great things will have people who hate them, but at the same time have those who love them. You can tell a lot about a person by who their enemies are. If a man's enemies are wicked people and his friends are all good people, then you most likely have a good man. Paul says by evil report and good report there in verse 8. Paul was constantly being slanderously reported. As it says in Romans 3, 8, Not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So you see, they were saying that Paul was preaching that since we're saved by grace, we can just we should just live however we want to. That was him being slanderously reported. As a minister, you're going to face evil report, people saying bad things about you, and you're going to face good report, people saying good things about you. But in 2 Peter 3.15, Peter calls Paul a beloved brother. That's good report. 2 Corinthians 6, eight, By honor and dishonor. By evil report and good report. As deceivers and yet true. Just because someone <coughs> calls a man a deceiver doesn't mean he actually is. People are going to talk about you till the day that you die. Just make sure that if they say anything about you that it's false. As we talked about in 1 Peter 3, 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Just make sure that it's false accusations. And you do that by just consistently trying to live right. That way nobody has anything evil to say of you. 2 Corinthians 6, 9, as unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. Has chastened and not killed. No matter how many people you know, you're still unknown to most people in the world and in history. Paul was at one point unknown by face to many Christians, and yet well known for being wicked. As it says in Galatians 1, through 23 and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only... That he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. So he was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea at one point. Now he's well known to almost all Christians. But most lost people don't know who Paul is. Even though he wrote good portions of the New Testament. You may be well known to a lot of people. You're still going to be unknown to a lot of people. So 2 Corinthians 6, 9, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Paul was constantly facing death and yet coming out living. He was needed by his converts. So the Lord was keeping him alive until he finished his course. In Philippians 1, 23 through 24, Paul says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. They couldn't kill Paul until he finished his course. <clears throat> but he says in 2 Corinthians 6.10, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Paul was in heaviness to tears, and yet constantly rejoicing in his salvation as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Paul was poor, but causing others to be rich in the faith. Just like the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2, 9, I know thy works in tribulation in poverty, but thou art rich. Even though they were in poverty, they were rich. Paul was giving the gospel and edifying the saints, and even if the saints were poor, he was making them rich in the faith. 
through the words of God. 2 Corinthians 6.11 O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. His mouth was open unto them. So that means he's being completely honest. He's very bold in what he's saying. Paul's heart was enlarged, so Paul had great affection for them. Our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. The Corinthians were so straightened in their in their own bowels, or, or so tightened up on the inside, from what many people might be, have been saying about Paul and things like that, that they couldn't find any room to love Paul. So he says in verse 13, Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. He wants their heart to be enlarged for him, just like his is was for them. But theirs for him seems to be a few sizes too small. But he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? If you're a born-again believer, then you don't need to hang out with people that are unrighteous. You don't need to hang out with people that are in darkness. You don't need to hang out with unbelievers. You might work with a lost person. You might be trying to help a lost person. Try to get them saved. But there is a difference between those things and hanging out with them. Going to the places that they go to to sin and fornicate and drink and all that. And being around all that all the time. There's a big difference between that and trying to help them. You shouldn't marry a lost person either. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. How can a righteous man fellowship with an unrighteous man? He doesn't want to talk about what you want to talk about. I can sit and talk about the Bible and he just looks at me awkwardly. He can sit and talk about different kinds of alcohol and movies and video games. and There is just no point of fellowship there. What communion hath light with darkness? Uh, you don't ever have complete light and complete darkness in the room at once. One of them has to give a little to let the other in. 2 Corinthians 6.15 And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Concord means agreement. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Christ isn't in agreement with Belial. He isn't in agreement with wicked men. A believer has nothing in common with an infidel, which is an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. If you're saved, then your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is in you. You're sealed into the day of redemption. See Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.30. Idols have no business in the temple of God. They should, have, they should not have the affection of your heart. God dwells in you, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery of the indwelling Christ as we call it. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So come out from your worldly circles your worldly churches, your worldly friends, and be a peculiar people, be separate, and be sanctified. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. If you're a son of God, act like a son of God.